Hi everyone. I have this project in mind uh, to turn my spin bike into a generator and it was really just for the fun of it. There's no way I will ever save money doing this, but it was a project I wanted to do. And obviously when you do any project you look on YouTube to try to find uh, some help or some hints. So I tried to do that with this project and I could not. All I could find with this project with people turning uh, full normal bicycles into generators using a car or an automotive alternator. So I, I didn't find a single thing anywhere on the internet with all of my research uh, about doing it with a spin bike. So I did it and I wanted to share this with you. So I want to start out with first of all why it was so much more common to see people turning normal bicycles into generators than spin bikes. And the reason for that is is how fast you can get the pulley on the generator on the alternator uh, to spin. So you want that to spin as fast as possible, which means basically uh, for every X number of turns you turn the crank on the bicycle, you want this turn as fast as possible. So if you have a larger diameter driving wheel, <clears throat> you will turn that faster for any given number of cranks. So that was one of my main concerns with using a spin bike, and it did in fact turn out to work. If you look at the diameter of the spin bike flywheel uh, versus like a 29er mountain bike or a road bike, it is much smaller. So that was one of my concerns, and it did work out that if you take into consideration uh, the number of teeth on there, the, the driving or the main drive, um, gear and then the secondary drive gear and then the diameter of the flywheel versus the diameter of the pulley on the alternator it actually did work out uh, that it does it does work so that was an issue and that was fine and then another thing i think an advantage of this design is that uh, the heavy flywheel will transfer some energy to the alternator if uh you know in events of changing pedal speed or you know whatever uh better than a lightweight rim would so doing my shopping you know i said this wasn't a money saving project but i didn't want to waste a ton of money on it so i went to a local store it was called so it's called fleet farm i live in wisconsin uh they're a big store in wisconsin minnesota uh, but they sell auto parts and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so I bought the cheapest alternator I could find. <clears throat> so this is it. Uh, basically, when picking out alternators, I had to choose uh, one of two main things here. Is is it a serpentine belt pulley or a V-belt pulley? And I knew it needed to be serpentine belt, uh, first of all, because those pulleys were much smaller diameter, which is good, which allows, you know, uh, for this fixed diameter uh, flywheel, you want the smallest diameter possible here to get this pull, uh, rotating as fast as possible. So uh, that's one of the reasons I picked this style, serpentine belt style. The other uh, reason was uh, the other style is a V-belt style, and those were generally easy to find cheaper. This one was on closeout, it was like 60 bucks. <clears throat> but the serpentine belts are available in much larger diameters, large enough to fit around the whole flywheel uh, in, in the way it's set up right now uh, than a V-belt would be. So this is another reason I wanted to get a serpentine belt type alternator. So I got this all set up. Uh, the way it's mounted is basically I took the, usually you have like rollerblade wheels in these tabs to allow the bike to get moved around easily. So if I ever want to move this thing, uh, it's going to be difficult. I'm going to have to pick it up or deinstall this or uh, get somebody to help me move this sucker around. But it's it's stationed now, so I had to remove the rollerblade wheels. And uh, what I did was I got some threaded rod. And fortunately, I bought the alternator before deciding on this design. But fortunately for me, the alternator uh, just had a through 
hole there and I just put the threaded rod through the alternator and put a nut and a washer on each side of each tab and on the side of the alternator and I was good to go. So now the alternator at this point is attached to my bicycle. The other thing that's important that I did to modify this here is that you need to tension uh, the belt. So what I did to tension the belt is I took an old road bike tire, I cut a rectangle out of it, I drilled and tapped a hole, I put a lock nut on there, and that allowed me to tension uh, the belt by pushing on the alternator. So this is the belt. The other thing that I had to do is find the correct length serpentine belt. So what I did is I took this and I took a string and I wrapped the string around the flywheel, around the pulley, and I got a, you know, approximate measurement of what that distance would be. And then I went to the same store. I got the alternator at and I got the serpentine belt. And you'll have to cross-reference this, whatever document you can find at the store. But if I remember correctly, this 695K6 here, I don't know what K6 means, but I'm pretty sure 695 uh, meant 69.5 inches. So obviously, this alternator could have moved a lot. I probably could have got a 68-inch or a 67-inch or a 74-inch or, you know, whatever. Uh, but I picked a heavy medium and... That's the insulation. Uh, the rest of it wasn't too difficult. I was able to move the felt pads so they're not touching at all. Uh, and I have fortunately was able to use them, uh, use them still if I want to. Uh, they're set to where they're very far out now, but I didn't ruin that part of the bike. Uh, where if I want to use the felt pads to add resistance or, or whatever, I can still use them. So to install this, I had to take the flywheel off, put it back on again, uh, tension the chain, um, basically remove the whole flywheel uh, portion of the spin bike, but that was all good. So we know the gear ratio from the crank to the drive of the flywheel, so let's also check out the ratio of the flywheel to the pulley. So this is about 18 inches and we'll have center let's call it 18 even and let's also check the pulley here uh this one's a little tougher let's call it two and an eighth so we will take into consideration the crank to uh, the drive gear and then also the flywheel to the pulley to figure out our total drive ratio our total drive ratio being the number of times I turn the crank to the number of times the pulley is turned on the alternator and uh, that's important because you need to know your cadence and how many uh, rpm you turn that versus how many RPM that is required to turn to work properly. Because in a car, you have an engine turning at X number of RPM at idle speed at its minimum, uh, and then that will turn your alternator. Now when I bought this, it came with uh, a tag attached to it. And uh, some cool things on the tag were, first of all, turn on RPM. 1351, I would assume that under that RPM, the alternator does not work. I'm not sure about that, but it would make sense. Uh, the next thing is amount of current, amps at 2000 RPM, 40 amps, and amps at 5000 RPM, 85 amps. Now at 2000 RPM, 40 amps, 40 amps at 12 volts is 480 watts. Now that is a lot of power. Considering this is 50% efficient, if you are having the alternator deliver 480 watts, you are putting out double that, and that would be pretty impressive. So if you can get this thing to turn at 2,000 RPM, 
anything that you want to power with this, you will be able to. The next portion I want to talk about is the electrical portion uh, of this whole setup. First of all, one of the main types of alternators, or one of the things you'll hear about alternators is uh, it's like a one wire or <clears throat> uh, is the voltage regulator internal ex or external. I mean, I think this alternator was from a pretty old car. I want to say it was from like a early 90s uh, GM type of car. But more information on it uh, in the links. But basically it has an internal voltage regulator. And from what I know, uh, a voltage regulator basically is this uh, module inside of the alternator that regulates the voltage to what's called a field current. And the field current will be adjusted inside of the alternator to regulate how much resistance or how much uh, how much resistance needs to be applied to the alternator to um, get the correct current output. So that is one cool thing about this system is that the voltage regulator will change your or change how hard you have to pedal uh, based on the electrical load involved in the system. So in this uh, alternator, basically usually when an alternator is installed, the chassis of the car's frame is going to be ultimately connected to the negative post of the um, battery. So that's what this white wire is. And uh, I used household wiring conventions here where black is positive and white is negative. Um, if there's any electrical people out there, <clears throat> I did not use automotive conventions. And I also am undersized in my wires, but I figure that if something starts on fire, <clears throat> I'll be here and I'll be able to stop pedaling and the fire should hopefully go out. So in all of my wiring, black is positive, uh, white is negative. And then in addition, you know, also what you'll see me using is using uh, household plugs to do this. Uh, if you were to plug this into the wall, bad things might happen, but uh, I'm the only one that lives here, and hopefully that won't happen. There are better ways to to wire this up as far as, uh, you know, plugs and conventions and wire size and stuff, but I didn't want to waste too much money on this project, so. Anyway, the other electrical thing that I had to uh, do was purchase this wiring harness. I found it on eBay, and basically there are four wires that come out of it. Uh, you only need to really use as far as in this system is one of them. Uh, this one is for the field current. Once again, that current is the current or the voltage used to create the electrical field in here to create the electromagnetic uh, resistance uh, in, in the alternator to uh, oppose the rotor to create the electricity. So. Uh, basically, the rest of the the theory behind the rest of the wiring basically was that all just like in a car, anything that's gonna use electricity is gonna go to the positive terminal, and uh, basically all positives has to get have to get connected together or tied together, and all negatives have to get tied together. So this uh, it's a cut up extension cable, and it goes up and it goes around and it goes into this little electrical box here. So all black wires are tied together in this Wago connector thing, and all white wires are tied together in this Wago electrical thing. Sorry about this other black wire. The other black wire that's here actually just goes out to like a, a car charger type of deal. So don't get confused by that. It's just that both of these wires are black. So it does, one of the black wires does go into the rest of the light wires. Don't get confused with that is the negative uh, portion of the car charger. <clears throat> and uh, 
What else did I do here? I have a positive going to a terminal here for external and a negative going to there for external. And then also I have a battery here. So the battery uh, is very important. When you start pedaling, you need external power to deliver power through this connector to the field current in the alternator. You cannot start the alternator itself without some sort of external current. And in your car, obviously, your battery does that. So I had to simulate that with this battery. In hindsight, you can do this with a much smaller battery. You can use several double A's, you know, however many double A's it takes to make 12 volts. You can use, uh, lithium ion batteries, the 18650s or whatever you want to do. And I, I've also heard that you can use fewer batteries uh, than normal to take or to, to use 12 volts, but I did end up getting a 12 volt battery because I didn't know this at the time. But basically what I did with this battery is I did fuse it, so I'm at least a little bit safe. This fuse is going to go through uh, a plug, the other side of the plug, so I can disconnect the whole system when I want to. Uh, this goes down where you saw it before. Uh, the other thing, or, sorry, where you saw it before, I'll, I'll be more specific. Uh, this is going to go into the box we had before, and that's going to just be the positive portion of the battery. It is fused. Uh, it is disconnectable, but that's what I have going on on the positive side of the battery. On the negative side of the battery, this is going through a wire, this is going up to the bike, and it goes up to a switch. So I did buy an automotive higher current switch, and that can turn on and turn off the battery. That'll be important later. Basically, when you start pedaling, the alternator will start putting out voltage and when it starts putting a voltage it's going to put out 14.4 volts and it will start charging the battery and at that point it will become hard to pedal so if you try to charge the battery it's going to require pedal force and if you don't have a way to disconnect the battery at that point <clears throat> it will be very hard to pedal i shouldn't say very hard to pedal if you want to charge the battery and do something else, it will be hard to pedal. So I want to find a means to disconnect the battery so you can put all of your pedaling energy into doing something else. Another thing I did on this bike was the field um, current wire. It goes up this connector, it goes up actually through uh, another Wago wire nut thing. I found on the internet, I don't know how true this is, but the circuit should have resistance. So you're not just giving um, unresisted power uh, to the alternator. So I, I found an LED, there's some resistance in that circuit. And that also goes through uh, a household um, light switch, which isn't probably the best application for this. But it allows me to uh, complete the circuit <coughs> to the field current in the alternator, which uh, you'll find, or you'll see later, is important. The other thing that's very important for this whole system is the power inverter. So this allows me to power whatever I want. So I have my positive voltage there, my negative voltage there. If I just turn the system on and don't power or don't pedal at all, I can use the battery's power to power whatever's plugged into here. And right now it's a television that I watch while pedaling. The cool thing about this setup is as soon as I start pedaling, <clears throat> the positive voltage that's in the capacitor in the inverter, if you follow this positive voltage um, wire around here, it goes into the uh, the DC bus in here and that'll ultimately end up at the voltage regulator 
the field current going to the voltage regulator. So once I start pedaling, once I've created voltage here, this provides voltage at the positive terminal here, terminal there, which will provide voltage back to the field current. So once I start pedaling and once I get this powered up, I can disconnect the battery and uh, not use any of my pedaling effort uh, to charge the battery and all my pedaling effort is going to power uh, the inverter which will power whatever is connected to the inverter. Alright, so now I'm going to give a little demo of uh, how the bike actually works and functions. So first of all, i got to plug it in. So I'm going to do that. The other thing uh, I have here, just for the heck of it, is a kilowatt. And it will tell you how much power we're using. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my power on, so it's plugged in, power's on, and now the uh, inverter has power. I'm going to switch this to watts. So right now we're using 6 watts, 4 watts, 2 watts. Not a lot. So what I'm going to do now is turn the TV on. The inverter worked a little bit harder. And now we're at 26 watts. Turn it down. Okay, sorry, I had to turn the power down there. So the TV's running at 25 watts. Uh, with the volume turned down. One of the coolest things about this whole system is that at least on this TV you can change the power saving options. So right now power saving is on high, turn on low, you can turn it off. It was at 25 watts. Now it's at 45 watts. So the power saving options will allow the TV to draw more or less power <clears throat> and that allows you to change how hard you're pedaling. Uh, also changing the, uh, the volume uh, will help with that as well. So you get to regulate how hard you're pedaling uh, based on uh, how much draw or how much uh, power is being drawn by the inverter. So right now the TV is just running off of the battery. So now I'm pedaling. So now that I'm pedaling, pedaling is very easy. There's no resistance really at all. I'm just getting the flywheel up to speed. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is turn my power saving back on high. That's good. I'm gonna come here. My uh, battery is on. My battery is powering the inverter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on and turn on the switch uh, that powers the field current in the alternator. So I turn that on, and it becomes very difficult to pedal. You probably heard that. So now I'm powering the TV and charging the battery. TV's on. The LED's on. Same as that circuit is active. Now it's pretty hard to pedal. <clears throat> I just turned off the battery, just went to the battery. So now all of my pedaling is going to operating the TV. And if I want to pedal harder or less hard, I can change power saving options. or turn up or turn on the volume. So 
So, the uh, last thing I want to talk about is how much work it takes. Uh, to power these, I just turned off the field coil. So everything turned off. And I turned off the uh, field current, I should say. Everything turned off. Um, Uh, basically, the last thing I wanted to say here is how hard are you going to have to pedal this thing? Um, if you look online and you research what pro bikers can do, they probably can put out 300 to 400 watts, maybe with the 500 on short uh, bursts. My cycling level is, I mean, if I can, if I have a flat surface with uh, no wind, I'd probably do between 17 and 18 miles an hour. A normal ride where I have to stop and there's wind and there's hills. Uh, usually right around 16. So that's my cycling uh, power. And I can really only power my TV and maybe charge a phone at the same time. So that's like 45 to 60 actual watts, maybe 70. The thing about this whole system is that uh, an alternator is only probably 50% efficient. So you are really probably, and they're really good. I mean, I would be surprised if you got to power more than 150 watts for any extended period of time. The uh, only other thing you can use this for is to charge a battery for an hour and use the battery for 20 minutes if you want to power more powerful things. But, uh, you know, like I said, strong cyclists can put out 300 watts pro level can put out probably 400 watts and i could be wrong on this you can read about that more than i just pulled off that in my head but um <clears throat> whatever uh whatever class of cyclists you put yourself in cut that in half because the alternator is not efficient the belt drive you lose some efficiency there you lose some efficiency at the chain drive you lose some efficiency at the uh, inverter <clears throat> so don't expect to power more than 50 percent of uh, how much power you can put out as a cyclist um, other than that i mean this was not a money saving project and if you expect to do this to save money by any means uh you're mistaken you would have to i haven't done the math because i know it's gonna be crazy but uh now say i actually use or put out a hundred watts uh you know say i put out 200 watts so it's 100 watts actually getting put out from the alternator if I do that for an hour, it's 100 watt hours, so that's a tenth of a kilowatt hour. Uh, a tenth of a, or a kilowatt hour is probably 18 cents now, I have no idea. Somewhere around there. So, you know, if I bike for an hour, I'm at a tenth of a kilowatt hour, it's like 1.8 cents for me biking for an hour. And you will never save money doing this. It, it was a hobby, it was fun, but you will spend more money on food easily uh to power this thing than you will to get power out of it after you've gone through all the inefficient portions uh, of the system <clears throat> so keep that in mind uh, it was a fun hobby it was a fun project uh, but it is definitely not a money saver by any means it is cool to know uh, you know that i charged my phone or that i powered my tv or that you know when the zombies come uh that i can produce some power uh, for myself you know that's a joke but uh so that part is neat as well so it is a fun project but uh it's not practical by any means uh, aside from having fun with it so uh, i just wanted to go through uh the setup that i put on my spin bike because this is i have not seen a spin bike uh bike generator on YouTube at all. I've only seen regular bikes converted to generators and I wanted to do my spin bike version of things. So, uh, thanks for watching.
Now I think one of the coolest things about this is this. I can ride along nice and easy, power my TV, ride at whatever RPM I'd like to. I can change my um, power requirements. The thing that I think is the neatest is that what this does is it always draws the same amount of power. So if I decide that I want to change my cadence or I want to get up and stand up, all I have to do is get up and stand up. The TV keeps going. So I can get out of the saddle, I can stand up and pedal, and then I can sit back down. And I can pedal faster with less force each pedal stroke, or without adjusting how hard my pads are pressing against the side of the flywheel. I can do this, and the voltage, regula voltage regulator automatically adjusts and demands more force from the pedals. So it's actually, uh, in that sense, an upgrade. Uh, the biking. It's kind of like if your road bike would shift for you.